Welcome to this episode of Clinically Pressed. We have Justin Dean, DC, on the show for this episode. Uh, Justin's a pretty unique guy, has done a lot of different things. It's been pretty, it was pretty interesting to hear all the things he's done from helping developing some online resources for people to working with some of the highest level uh, track athletes in the world. Uh, it's pretty incredible. We're definitely going to try and get in around two around track and field in general, and just with my personal interest in it. And just because it's one of those sports that I feel like if we go and you really focus on it, you can make most efficient movements to be the best. And that's where we can have our largest effect. But we talk about that dermal traction method, which is something unique that we're definitely going to check out. Uh, just a lot of good insight here and some things to take a look at. So very interesting episode with him. Uh, our friends over at Paragon Recovery. Yes, Paragon Recovery. They switched up the name a little bit. They're sh shifting their focus more to the recovery side of it, and they are crushing it. We highly recommend checking those guys out. We've got a great episode coming up in the near future with Paul Sheckelman, one of their founders. Can't wait to get that out. But if you go check that out, use promo code CP15 to get 15% at checkoff. If you could, subscribe to Clinically Pressed on iTunes. We keep hearing across all the podcast episodes that we listen to that it truly does help. Please go over, subscribe, give us a five-star rating. If you're watching this right now, we give you the quick tutorial on how to do this um, via some video, but please do that. Check it out. We truly appreciate it. Thank you and enjoy this episode. Welcome to this episode of Clinically Pressed. We're here with Dr. Justin Dean, who's out in California, which I'm guessing the weather is a little nicer than what we're dealing with here in Wisconsin. Uh, but we're going to talk multiple things today from dermal traction method, uh, which we're super curious about, uh, rehab to performance, working internationally, and it sounds like you got a bunch of other things coming up in the hopper. So before we jump into all that, do you want to give your own little background? Um, sure. sure. About, how about yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Dr. Justin Dean. I am traditionally trained as a chiropractor. Um, and then I also have been trained in a lot of um, different methodologies and thought processes in the areas of like re rehabilitation, pain science, uh, neurodynamics, and a lot of fascial interventions. So I'm kind of a, uh, not just the whole, I'm going to crack your back and see you later kind of chiropractor. I uh, work more in the sports medicine department. I've um, been practicing now for five years. I started off in Portland, uh, went to China, then Nigeria. Now I'm in LA, setting down some roots again. Yeah, that had to be uh, quite the change of pace. Uh, we've got a former colleague who's over in China as an athletic trainer right now. Oh, very cool. Uh, working with the fencing team, and so I've gotten to hear some of that stuff. Is he in uh, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Beijing? I honestly don't know where he is right now. It sounds like he is traveling all over the place. Um, That's what I did. National yeah. team, so yep. we'll see. Same thing I did. Uh, I think, I don't know, you want to talk about internationally to start off since we kind of finished with yeah. that. Like, What was that like, especially going over um, different cultures? I know one thing that um, my colleague said he's kind of struggled with is just breaking that cultural barrier, but then – the ability to get them to trust, uh, especially coming in as an, you know, a foreigner to help them out. Yeah, it's, um, it has unique challenges, pros, both, um, per pros and cons. Uh, I would say the hardest thing is, um, you know, if anybody ever has the opportunity to go over work in specifically Asian cultures, such as China, we really need to understand there is a huge diff different way of thinking. Um, and especially if you're a young, younger clinician, such as myself, I went over there at 28 years old. Um, age there is quite important because um, you, it's there's mo like here you respect your elders. Here in the United States, you know, respecting your elders is a thing. There, it's life. You know, like if you're if you're a sibling and you're one year older, that's huge in the family dynamics. Where here, it doesn't kind of matter that much. You know, 
it's not as important. So the, the, you do your research on like things like what does it mean to keep face? Uh, what does it mean to like, how do they think? Because that's how you're going to get maximum performance out of an athlete is you have to understand how they think so that you can kind of, you can go into those biases and explain it in a way that they can understand. So that's, that's, that's the hardest obstacle. The hardest obstacle is not the language barrier. The yeah. hardest, hardest obstacle is how do you get inside of the old dome, the old noggin, and help that athlete perform at their maximum level. And that was, I mean, I'm a, I was a country, country bumpkin raised on a tractor, that kind of thing. So me going over to, to Shanghai without any coaching, without any cultural classes. I mean, I got off, um, they, I got called up by Altus, which is a track and field kind oh, of, nice. um, track and field powerhouse. Right. Uh, uh, in Phoenix, where all the best track and field athletes in the world train. And they called me up and asked me if I wanted to go to China. And I was like, mm, no. <laughs> and my mentor at the time, Philip Snow, uh, like literally physically slapped me in the back of the head and was like, no, you got to go. This is a great opportunity. And then I thought about it. I was like, sure, I'll go. And then I was like, okay, so when, when does this thing start? Well, two weeks. <laughs> so I originally had two weeks. It turned out to be a month, but I thought that I was leaving the country in two weeks. So I get there and it, yeah, you just, if you're going to work in a foreign country, you have to be extremely flexible. As you get there, I thought I was working with one team in Shanghai. I get, I get shipped to another city called Guangzhou because it was warmer there to work with an entirely different team. And then, I, so I was just bouncing around team to team, and you, you kind of just have to go with the flow in, in a because in a, they're gonna they're gonna put you places, and what's on your contract is not what's probably going to happen. <laughs> so your contract doesn't mean anything there. It's just you gotta you gotta go with the flow, and you gotta be super malleable, and adaptive. Right. And, and it can be it can be quite it was a quite a shock for me those first few months. It took me a little bit. Um, the way I actually learned was going out to the bars and talking to other foreigners that had been there for a while and explaining things to me. <laughs> I had uh, the fortune to go over to India a couple of times to do a couple week long you know, a couple courses when I was only there for like a week to ten days. But yeah, you want to talk about something completely different and mm. just trying to understand and whether they're actually getting anything out of it and so it took a little getting used to, but it was worth it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indian, that, that India, that's a completely different culture as well. Yeah. So let's see. So then also I had the opportunity to work in Nigeria. I was helping the Nigerian soccer team prepare for the World Cup a bit. And that was um, a completely uh, different set of um, obstacles, whereas um, – you're working with these very talented athletes that don't have an athletic background, if that makes sense. Yep. So I mean, they're, they're, they don't have any traditional strength training, probably never been in a gym, from what I could tell, at least not a proper gym. Right. No, no idea of lifting mechanics. And basically, they're just good at soccer, and they, 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 they drive around the villages, and they like look at that, like, look at that guy, and then they grab him, and, and you know, they, start, they start going up through the ranks. So that's a completely uh, different environment. And um, and a completely different world, really. Uh, my wife is also Nigerian, so I understand that culture way better. So that was much much easier. Um, so yeah, so every single country you go to, you're gonna have to adapt, and you're gonna have to, and you're gonna have to just find out their belief systems. That's the biggest thing. Language is whatever, because you can always have translation. You can use simple, simple words, but if you don't speak in a way that they that resonates with their goals, then you're gonna you're gonna run into trouble. And I, I definitely had trouble in my first three months in China. But then I adapted and it was fine. For sure. Anything else you wanted to cover quickly in background? Uh, I really want to jump into this dermal traction method and just kind of where that came about with maybe some background, like you said, in your myofascial uh, yeah, really techniques and different things that you've learned and done along the way. Okay, so dermal traction method. Let's do a little history lesson. So after I graduated in 2014, I started working with a guy named Philip Snell, who's, who's 
becoming very well known as the, the low back guy. So as, as if you're looking for the best course to take on low back pain, he without a doubt is it. And basically, you get an acute low back, 10 out of 10 pain with antalgic forward lean, like, AKA okay, I can't get out of bed because my back hurts so much. And within visit one, we can get them deadlifting 35 pounds from the floor without pain. And it's just, it's just about using pain science, movement, McKenzie, neurodynamics, and every tool we've ever learned together to, to really empower that patient that they're not broken and their, their spine is not like, it's not something that's good. Like they don't have a bad back. They just need to learn how to move properly and, right. uh, and spare the things that are being stressed excessively. I apologize, I have a little bit of a cold, so I have running notes. Nope, you're all good. Uh, <clears throat> so, and then dermal traction. So that was a kind of a little bit of a background there. So let me get more in the background. So dermal traction was co-invented by myself and Dr. Philip Snell, of Fix Your Own Back, uh, about, let's see, back in like 2000, what is it now, 13 or 14? And the way it came about was... Um, a, uh, one of my good friends, Ben Ramos, who's a chiropractor in San Diego, we were the very first chiropractors, from my understanding, in the United States to be trained by um, a clinician out of Australia, a PT known as Michael Shacklock, and he teaches neurodynamics. Fantastic course. And so it, and we took that information, we came back, and Philip and I were discussing one day, we had a plantar fasciitis case that was not responding to anything else that we did and it was really frustrating us and we're like we knew that the the saphenous nerve supplied that the skin of that area but we didn't so we knew the, the anatomy but we didn't have a tool to address that anatomy okay so we started troubleshooting like okay based on what we learned from shacklock and knowing principles and research related to how macro nerves move, aka the sciatic nerve, spinal cord, that kind of thing, how those guys move and what kind of um, physiology related to compression syndromes uh, versus intr intrinsic pressure on nerves, we started, how would we apply that information to cutaneous nerves, nerves that live in the skin? And from that, we came up with dermal traction method, which is basically um, finding that cutaneous nerve in the skin, so being very specific on where you place your hands, providing a traction motion and having them go through the provocative mo motion um, that was bothering them. So in the plantar fasciitis case, it was they're walking on their heels and it was causing them sharp pain, did dermal traction at the medial ankle, pain was completely reduced. And the important thing about this case that really kind of exploded this was we did that. And this, this is something we a patient that we threw the kitchen sink at mm -hmm. with us, which was a lot of information that we were throwing at this guy that we you know, we learned from all over the world and wasn't responding. We did that as a trial and he, it responded great. He went to Europe and walked around in Europe on a vacation for three weeks, didn't have any flare ups, came back, three months later and his pain was still gone. So that was, that was really quite substantial. So we we're like, okay, so let's start extrapolating this to the whole body. And, and, and here we are today in 2019 and we have the entire body mapped up with the cutaneous nerves, how to treat them, when it's clinically indicated um, and how it, how it applies to the overall treatment paradigm and how you can use it as a home care exercise, if you will, or mobilization that they can do at home. In a way, it kind of gets rid of the lacrosse ball that's so popular in CrossFit. Right. Yeah. So. Oh, oh go ahead. So basically, it's um, the cutaneous nerves. It's funny enough that we have this podcast. I actually got a paper cut. I'm at, where's my thumb at? Right there. <laughs> nice. I got a paper cut yesterday. A cutaneous nerve is like a paper cut. There's not a huge amount of tissue issues but it hurts like shit <laughs> yep so if you address that you can make intense pain like you know very sharp pinpoint pain reduce quite quickly and when i say quite quickly i mean like 10 seconds like instantly um if it is if, if it isn't true entrapment syndrome of the cutaneous nerve in the superficial fascia so it can be a very powerful method of modulating pain. 
know, am I here claiming that it fixes the source of the problem? I don't, I, I can't make that claim. But it is a powerful tool in the toolbox, especially if you're, like for me, I work with track athletes. If they're in between intervals and they have knee pain, let's say, it's a very quick thing that I can do to get just in between the intervals for them to get back on the track and reduce their pain so they can finish the workout, get the metabolic and physiologic need, exercise needs that we need for to run fast because there's more to the, <laughs> the equation than just rehab. You know, you got you to gotta be a sports performance clinician. They still have to be fit. And right. So that's where dermal traction, from what I see, kind of fits into the, the treatment paradigm of working in a sports setting. There's also the chronic pain setting, but we can talk about that if, later. <laughs> So that brings up a bunch of questions, uh, but I think good ones, and I'll let you kind of say how much you want to without giving away kind of the nuts and bolts of the course. I'm sure that you're involved with it, but um, the, the track instance that you used, and I've wondered this, you know, multiple times with different interventions we've used in the past. Um, I've worked with some track in my career as well, but. So in that instance where you said they come over and they have like generalized knee pain and this is something to potentially help get them through in your experience, like how often do you see that where it's just necessarily like a pain signal versus something like physically wrong in the musculoskeletal system that potentially is causing that? And then kind of to throw two questions at you, how do you see this and kind of going along with trigger points and some of their referred pain theories? Okay. Um, let's see, where to start? Just, <laughs> Sorry, that was a lot. Can we start with the trigger point part? Sure. Okay, well, first, to discuss trigger points, we have to have an active definition of what a trigger point is. Okay. But we don't have that because nobody can agree on what a trigger point is. Right. Uh, from a surgical standpoint, if you cut somebody open exactly where there's a trigger point with referred pain when you push on it, there's nothing there. There's no balled up fascia. So um, I don't know what a trigger point is exactly. Okay. To, to just be like very honest. I'm not saying that, they don't, that the, the pain phenomena don't exist, but I, I can't really classify what it is that's actually causing the pain to my current knowledge. Yeah. Uh, so... Therefore, uh, it's a little different because this doesn't necessarily, it's usually, there is referred pain syndromes with this, but it's usually pretty, it's pretty pinpoint pain. So like, for example, I mean, if you have pain in the anterior shoulder and it hurts right there and I pull right there and lift it again, and it doesn't hurt, then, then that's, that's not probably not a trigger point. That's gotcha. it. It's exactly the opposite. The way most people treat trigger points is they push on it, right? Right. I'm suggesting exactly the opposite, a lifting effect, almost okay. like traditional Chinese cupping, Yep. but without the bruising, without the blood stagnation, and with movement, so it's a lot more practical and dynamic. Yes. So, it's, so it's not a treatment that should be replacing other treatments. It's just a new tool in the, in the belt to address a tissue strata that most most of us never considered before. Right. So what was the other question? Sorry. Um, just like in terms of looking at like that track athlete that you had mentioned that might have like knee pain as your example. And, you know, we're applying this and not thinking that there is a potential like musculoskeletal injury that's causing that. Okay. And just okay. kind of it, how you would run through that real quick with, like you said, still returning them to what they're doing without a full rewarm up or basically stopping practice in order to get it taken care of. Right. So we wouldn't stop practice. I mean, the reason like at Altus, what we would do is literally if they have 90 seconds rest between intervals, that's, I got, I have 45 seconds to address a problem. So it's not, I don't have that much time and we're not going to stop a workout unless we absolutely have to, because you start, start, stop, stop in workouts. And people that have worked in track know that people always have aches and pains. Right. So, you know, we're not going to stop because that workout is what's is what's going to make that athlete succeed. And what I'm doing is just a supplementary um, addition to keep them out there so that they can succeed. So, so from a biomechanical standpoint, if they have, let's say, medial knee pain, 
and I, I do derm attraction method and it works great now after the workout or like in our in our in a clinical setting i'm going to be looking at how that hip and ankle work and how they're controlling what their ground reaction forces are that's causing that nerve to have a quick stretch and get irritated so maybe they're not controlling their pelvis or their oblique chain from opposite shoulder to hip is off uh, maybe they're um, they're arching their back a little bit when they lift that 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 right leg, which is causing them to lose stability of the 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 relationship between the pelvic and the uh, the pelvic floor and the diaphragm. The, the possibilities from a biomechanical model of why they're having knee pain are that's when things can get quite complicated. Right. And. Um, I mean, most of the time it's not complicated. It's pretty easy to see what the hell's going on. But what I'm saying is, is if you do DTM in between the workouts, and in, 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 during the workout, it gives you an idea of where to start searching in your orthopedic and clinical exam. That makes sense. Yeah. So whatever nerve you addressed, think about from a biomechanical step perspective, how would that nerve become stressed? Yep. And then, and then that it's giving you a big window into um, how you're going to progress, say, a, a rehabilitation uh, programming and manual therapy and pretty much everything. Right. So is that something with like your patients that you see on a regular basis? Do you use it as part of like your evaluation and your screening? I use it as part of the big picture. So it is kind of a part of an evaluation and screening. For example... <laughs> <clears throat> Let's say they have upper back pain and um, I do dermal traction on the T1 dorsal rami and it takes away all of their pain. My job is not done. I still need to adjust the lower, the lower neck biomechanics and see what's becoming stress that's causing that T1 dorsal rami to become irritated in the first place. Is it because they're in a computer posture like this and they're stressing their heads in front of their body and they're stressing that area of the body, you know, the possibilities are endless. Is it because they're a pitcher and they're, and they're not controlling, um, they're not planting their front leg very well and rotating through the hip. And as a result, they're kind of doing some shoulder hiking and they're like this, you know, the, the, so it's just part of the exam. It's just piecing together. The way I like to think about doing an exam is if we look at it from a, um, a statistic standpoint, do you remember scatter plots? Oh, yes. Okay, so you have a line of best fit, right? You have a bunch yep. of data like that looks like just a bunch of dots, and then you find a line of best fit, right? That's the way I look at a clinical exam. You have a bunch of findings that point you in a general direction. And, but if you, if you just focus on one of those dots, you could very easily miss the big picture. Right. Especially if you're focusing on an outlier. Yeah, no, definitely. So that's, that's why we do the line of best fit in statistics. So that's, that's the way I look at clinical exams. You're going to get a bunch of noise, but which, which direction is it leading you? That makes sense. I, I had I'd never heard an analogy like that to it before, but I, I like that one. That's good. Yeah, it's funny. I sucked at statistics too, but that stuck. <laughs> oh, it's one area that I'm like, man, if I ever had just you know a spare whatever to pretend to go and figure it out better i would but yeah if you, if you want to get better at that stuff uh patrick ward is the guy okay patrick ward he's with the seattle seahawks he and he's a numbers man like crazy he's good at that stuff we will look that up anything else that you'd like to touch on with uh dermal attraction method that we didn't get to I think that um, that's pretty well covered. Um, I do teach seminars related to that. It's not exclusively dermal traction method. I teach a weekend course, which is uh, the clinical, the clinical audit process and um, dermal traction together in a full weekend. So okay. The it kind of the way I treat is very sometimes different. I think because I've taken so many seminars, I pick and choose what tool I want for which. Yep. So I teach is I combine all those tools together and I, and I teach the idea and the mindset that if you don't get a significant clinical positive outcome with a 
with an intervention, whether it's manual therapy, exercise, whatever, then you probably don't actually have a legitimate diagnosis. Does that make sense? Oh, that makes complete sense. I that's, so, that's one have, that we've really focused on is not living in an extremes of anything mm-hmm. in that it's it's never the same per person or if there was one method that fixed everything, that that would be the method. But like there is if you have bicipital tendonitis, to bis- I'm not even going to call it tendonitis because that's so rare. Bicipital pain here. Yeah. Pain in the front of the shoulder. If you have that, there's a, there's a million reasons you're going to have that. Right. And, and that's just an anatomical area of the body that you have pain, but you don't know why it hurts unless you reduce it. Right. And then that's the, that's, that's the whole point of the course is how to reduce pain very quickly using – pick and choosing from various thought process from around the world and then just apply it. It's it's what I I call it the the first visit course, what to do on the first visit to get maximum results. And ultimately I have this beard for a reason because I'm a young, I mean, I'm 30 years old people. I, I only have about 10, 15 minutes to really get people's attention. Right. Or they just think I'm some young kid that doesn't know what he's talking about. (laughs) Can understand that. So it comes from that where I need to impress people, I need to wow people, I need to take down their pain by 40, 50 percent quite quite quickly so that I can establish trust and I can truly help them over the long term. So when you say you kind of pick and choose from the things that you like, are, do you have some favorites? I don't I hesitate to say go to's, but ones that you see. I mean, I have favorites in different often. regions of the body. Um, like. You know, for if we're talking spine, obviously McKenzie and uh, neurodynamics, both of which I have permission to teach. Um, so McKenzie, neurodynamics, DTM, uh, and then DNS, dynamic neuromuscular stabilization out of Prague. So those are kind of like my staples, if you will. And then I throw in different um, manual therapies from different areas. Uh, it, it, it's actually quite simple. Like once you look at the body from a global perspective, you're and you end up doing the same eight to ten things on everyone the first visit, right? With certain exceptions, if you get like a wrist that comes in, that might be a little a little different because the wrist is pretty far away from the spine, um, but maybe not. You know, so basically, screen the spine first before you do anything, and then. Screen the spine first, then eliminate stresses on the area of the spine that is in the same myotome, dermatome as your pain pattern, and then see what happens. And if that doesn't work, move on. But you're going to find 60 to 80% of the time, if you just do those two things, the pain's going to clear up quite quickly. And as I explained to my patients, pain, getting you out of pain is the easy part keeping you out of pain that, that's going to require the work right i've seen those with a couple other things it's like oh it went away and it's like yeah but now how do we maintain that yet still let you be an active person or compete in your sport and allow you to do what you want to do and maintain that for the long run exactly so that's that's um that's that's exactly the the way i, I go about this is like let's get you out of pain because when the house is on fire it doesn't matter if it's an electrical problem, the gas stove blew up. You don't care. You want the fire department to come and put the fire out. Right. And then we're going to reverse engineer the process and figure out what the hell's wrong. So that's, that's the way I explain it to patients. I like that. That's a good analogy. That's one I think um, I've seen, at least in our athletic training population, is we get very focused on the pain is here, what is wrong here, mm-hmm. and don't necessarily always address that kind of working into out or what could be the other confounding factors we're hoping it's just that one specific area and that's what we aim to fix and there's been a large push in let's say the social media world to kind of negate the what's going on here thing mm-hmm. and ignore it and just look globally and and i'm kind of trying to bring it back to like yeah let's look globally but what's going on here right you need <laughs> but, a healthy dose of both what is the what is the pain generating mechanism? Right. Like you know, great. 
Um, you have valgus collapse of your knee, which is probably one of the only things that has any kind of clinical relevance in the research. Great, you have that. Um, yeah, we're going to address your hip, knee, core, whatever, you know, whatever. But you still need to figure, you still need to assess what structures in the medial knee are generating the pain. Right. The mechanism behind that medial knee pain. Whether it's spinal derived or not, you at least need to know so you can expedite treatment. Yeah. I, yeah, I was glad you brought up cupping. That's one that I've used for several years now. Um, not traditional, but just suction right up with it and baffled myself a little bit. It's just like, okay, like that's getting rid of all of these issues and it feels great, but I don't know that we're actually affecting a whole lot of structures in terms of like getting down deep into like if there's quad pain, like putting cups on the quad, you're not getting that deep into any muscle tissue. Um, so I think this is interesting just in how, or is it really just a pain modulation thing while we still try and figure out what the heck is actually causing all that issue? Yeah. And there's, I mean, there's different camps from around the world and there's different ways of thinking. The sexy thing on social media these days is, oh, it's just a pain, it's just a pain modulation thing, brain mm -hmm. thing. It's just your brain modulating pain. And that's absolutely has some value, but the problem that I see, and I've only been out five years, but I have had the opportunity to take and learn from thought leaders from very different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. thing, the thing that I find overwhelmingly to happen is that once people get into a belief system, they kind of just put everything into that belief system, aka it must be the brain and everything's controlled by the brain, so let's just tell everyone to be happy and they'll start to feel better. <laughs> right. Or it's the fascia and everything's caused by tight fascia. So let's just work the fascia and ignore the brain and ignore rehab. Or it's everything's a movement problem and let's just work rehab and and screw the other stuff because it doesn't matter because everything's a movement biomechanical issue. And I, I and, verse, and since I've been exposed to all these different people, it, it becomes frustrating when I'm like, okay, if it's 40% the brain, 30% movement and what I, what I, what 70%, there we go. And then 30%, 20% fascia and 10% nerve. Right. If you're, which is probably a legit clinical scenario, it's never 100% one thing, probably. The body is a crazy, complex, dynamic system. Like, if you, if you only focus on 40%, 30%, 10%, your results are going to be 40%, 30%, 10% based on which camp you decide to you decide to go into. And you are going to help a lot of people that fall into that 40% category, but you're not going to help everyone. Right. No, I like that. Um, that kind of brings up another question because you kind of brought it up with people focusing on one thing. Where do you on all of this kind of fall on the evidence-based practice versus kind of evidence influence practice versus practice based evidence. Um, it just I can picture as you were saying some of those camps, potentially I, some people that you could be referencing that I know are very this is this is it, this is the thing, but so I come from a standpoint of I'm not a researcher, I'm a clinician. So my responsibility, my obligation as a healthcare provider has nothing to do with evidence. What I mean by that is I'm, my responsibility is to help that patient feel better. And if I do a treatment that doesn't have any evidence behind it, such as DTM, DTM has zero evidence behind it. Mm -hmm. There's indirect evidence that I use from other macro nerves, and there's lots of indirect evidence that I use from all over the – but there's no direct evidence that DTM works. So is it – for me – if I just go down the evidence base camp where I, I withdraw that treatment from my arsenal because there is no evidence behind it, I find that unethical. Interesting. So, I, had, I hadn't worked that far down that line. I like that, though. Yeah, so many people are like, if there's no evidence, I don't do it. Right. And I'm just kind of like, you're full of shit. So well, I wondered on those, it's just like, okay, if there's no evidence for it, then it's not good. So what do you what do you do? Like, I don't, I haven't well, done my due diligence in going through all of the evidence for all the things, you know, just 
I just haven't gotten there yet, but there's well, so I mean, much contradiction in the evidence that it's hard to extrapolate things anyway. Not, as, not only is there contradiction in evidence, which is why we have systematic reviews, which is to give you that whole scatter plot scenario again yeah. with all the line of best fit. Yep. Um, not all, but there's biases. Like oh. what? Is, like what is the researcher trying to show? Like what is it they're trying to prove to themselves and others? So that's going to throw out a huge bias. So you could have an evidence that shows whatever treatment A is superior to treatment B. Like for example, if you want to destroy the the idea that exercise doesn't matter, like if you want to set up a clinical trial and and you have a, a bias in your head that I don't think exercise really matters for low back pain. All they need is time to heal because you know most people get better with time. Right. You could set up a clinical study that shows time is better than exercise just by the way you choose it, just by the way you set up the clinical trial. Right. Is, is that really evidence? It's some evidence. It's some evidence that whatever you chose for your exercise intervention wasn't effective. But that doesn't mean that exercise as a global perspective is ineffective. Yeah, the blanket statements out of that yeah, are and, pretty tough. And, I've, man, as a seminar pre pre presenter, it's really hard not to do those blanket statements because people really like to, to latch on to them and they really like to fall into camps and tribes. And it reminds me of, like, you know, like little tribes that go to little war with each other about who's right. Right. And, and, to be honest, nobody's right. Nobody has it all figured out. Not myself, nobody. Like, we're still learning. If we had it all figured out, then we would stop researching. So that's kind of like my own pet peeve of what I've noticed um, with my some of my mentors, some of um, other people, people out there, is they really they become quite well-known for falling into a camp and being right. quite argumentative on that camp. And I have no qualms. The pain science crowd is the worst. I have n nothing against pain science. I read the shit out of pain science research, and I use that in my clinical practice every day. But I'm not a psychologist. If I wanted to be a psychologist, I would have got the degree for it. So, and I have a minor in psychology, so maybe I am a psychologist. I, I mean, you got yeah, at least got some credibility to it, and not but, just a book you read over the weekend. But my minor in psychology, you could read three books and get the same information. Probably, <laughs> you know, what is a degree even worth? But, Fair. Fair. You know what I'm kind of saying? Like, we need to be able to learn everything and not get so pigeonholed into a, a technique system or a line of thought. And I think that in the next five years, those weaknesses of being in one camp are actually going to start to show their ugly faces. I've wondered that same thing, and I've gone back and forth on, you know, this, quote, jack of all trades. You know, is that a good thing or is it a bad thing or just the way that the world's going? Do you need to specialize? And I think it's all within a context, but no, I'm with you because I think it's it's the same thing. Like, if you all you have for a tool is a hammer, everything you see it looks like a nail, whether it is or it is not. And you can miss some really big things, and so you either, A, need to – expand what you do kind of that jack of all trades or you gotta have a really good team where everybody can check their ego mm -hmm. you know where everybody can work together and you know if i'm not getting something to respond in my kind of areas that i think are going to work i could turn over to you and say hey you give it a shot because i'm not something i'm not seeing that maybe you would and i think that's unbelievably important yeah totally man and uh, where is i going to go with this i'm not opposed to anybody's I, I'm kind of the jack of all trades if we want to like put a label, yeah. and that's purposely what I'm doing, just because I want to be able to help as big as much people as I can. Because there's still people I can't help sometimes, right. which is why I keep learning. Um, if you want to specialize, there's absolutely nothing wrong with specializing. It's it's called in marketing. It's called a niche market. Right. Really easy way to become known for a particular thing, like low back pain, whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. What, what, what becomes wrong is when you say everyone else is wrong when they don't agree with your specialization. That's, that's, that's when we start running into <clears throat> some really ethical issues, in my opinion. Agreed. And, and it, it's on the same grounds as racism, as, in my opinion. Like it's, it's, it's like hating somebody else for their belief system or 
the color of their skin or whatever. It's just like it's madness that it's perpetuated in in the medical community in the United States. Yeah, it doesn't happen in other places. It's just the United States. Interesting. Well, you know, everybody's got to make a buck on social media and have the latest and greatest. Yeah, you could cut this out, but I'm going to say it anyways, just because I think it's funny. Um, I just I I think of these um, most of this stuff kind of like, and I don't know why we're getting into this, but it's a bunch of it's like like hanging out with a bunch of sixth grade six six year ah, sixth grade boys when everyone's talking about who has the biggest dick, but yet nobody's willing to actually whip it out and show it. <laughs> But yeah. like, you can cut that out, but that's that's essentially the way I look at this stuff. Everyone's talk bragging, but nobody's willing to like prove it. <laughs> right. No, I I agree with that. Um, I know you said you got a patient probably in like fifteen minutes or so. Uh, did you want to kind of jump into the questions that we kind of ask everybody? We can tailor yeah. them as the time allows. Because I don't want you to be late for that. Yeah, totally. Let's do it. So the first one, um, just because we kind of jumped into it before, is you know in your area of expertise, and if you could define that for us, um, how would you make what you do that is complicated simple? And you said that's what you kind of do on the weekends. So how would you yeah. kind of summarize that? So what is my area of expertise? I would call myself just a um, a generalist on pain and movement dysfunction. Um, that's where I have focused all my time. Um, basically, I focus all my time learning and how do I get somebody that is have a, has a problem, whatever it is, and how do I help them? Is it that they can't pick up their child because their back's hurting? Is it you know blah blah blah? Fill in the blanks. That's where I I don't I don't do nutrition that much. I don't do any of the functional neurology stuff. I'm I'm just a what is it that you can't do with your body and let's make you do it. That seems general. So what is it that's complicated? Um, that you could make simple. Um, well, this is actually—I mean, this is what I teach in my seminars. Is uh, the majority of pretty much. Ooh, it doesn't matter the complaint in the body. About eighty percent of it's going to boil down to six things: six movements and or exercises that you could do that'll probably reduce the symptoms. Day one, I'm not claiming fixing. I'm saying modulate that patient's symptoms so they can be more functional and dynamic in those life in their life. Usually, it's a spine centered movement, a a neurodynamic movement of either the spine or upper or lower extremity, and a educational resource on how to stop stressing that tissue. That usually turns into about five or six things. I just listed three. Fair enough. So the human body treating a patient, getting somebody out of pain, if you know what you're looking for, it's it's, it's, it's not that difficult for your run-of-the-mill, I have whatever kind of pain patient, what, what feeds most of our practices. Is that Does that answer your question? It does. That that's, was well said. Okay. Um... We stole this one from Tim Ferriss, but we had tailored it. What would be the most influential fitness purchase for under a hundred bucks or around? Anything that you recommend or that you use? Um, we talking about books? Are we talking about? Um, just anything, and book recommendations could be right after it. So, oh, book recommend is right after it. Most influential purchase. I mean, obviously, I'm biased. I mean, we have a fifty dollar membership fee to DTM, so that's pretty cheap. <laughs> there you go. So maybe I'll plug myself there. Hey, nothing wrong with that. And fill up. Um, yeah, actually, honestly, for fifty bucks, that's probably the best educational resource you'll get. Okay. You're gonna charge a thousand probably, but we we wanted everyone to get this information because for it's sure, so, so simple and effective. Well, then, right into book recommendations. Uh, do you have a particular subject? I mean, anything that you, whether it's you know, business leadership things like that, or specifically to how you treat people, we're all we're just looking for what you consider some of your favorites. Some of my favorites. Oh man, that's a good question because I, I have so many. I can't even remember them all because I've. <laughs> I mean, if you haven't in in, in the low back world. If you haven't read McGill's books, you definitely should. Yep. 
Um, if you couple McGill's books with like a, a book, a pain science book like World of Hurt, you can very quickly piece the bi biomechanical model and the pain science model together and, and have a really well-rounded view of low back pain. So I would say, I would put those two together and from there, because most of us see low back pain more than anything else, at least if I extrapolate to the nation. Yep. Uh, from there, you can take those concepts that you learn and then extrapolate to the whole entire body. I like it. Um, last one we'll go with is if you could go back and tell yourself something in your training or education, if um, going back five to ten years, so maybe five just um, or seven, kind of right when you're starting chiropractic school, what would you go back and tell yourself? Um, I probably would have not gone to chiropractic school. Interesting. Um, mainly because, like most most of this stuff, I, I probably would have just been a massage therapist because everything that I've learned that I use on patients patients on a daily basis, I didn't learn in chiropractic school, except for orthopedic tests, neuro, um, you know, pathology, and all that stuff. All the things that come with being a doctor. So. Um, if I if there's a young aspiring person that just wants to work with movement and pain, you can you can I would save the two hundred thousand dollars that you spend in chiropractic school, and I would spend it on seminars, and you would be in you twenty years ahead of where you would be after four years of doing that than you would be after four years of chiropractic school. Because chiropractic school is great; it's a very valuable tool, but it's a very limited tool from an entire perspective. Um, and that's just my opinion. I, I know that some chiropractors here are going to like slice my jugular vein and stuff like that. Huh. Uh, but that's, that's, that's honestly kind of my opinion right now. Like I, I enjoy having the word doctor in front of my name it makes me feel like I'm important or something, but realistically, right. um, if I would have just been very, very motivated as a person, I wouldn't, that's not necessary. I probably would have just went to physical therapy school so I don't have to like defend myself every day I'm a chiropractor. Oh my god. I can imagine that, yeah. You know, it gets really freaking old just having to defend yourself because of some dumbasses out there saying they can cure cancer. Yeah, we still gotta separate ourselves from the personal trainer. Yeah. Well there's some personal trainers out there that are freaking good, man. That you aren't wrong. Yeah, you, you aren't wrong there. Yeah. So just to wrap up again, because I know you got to get going with the patient, where can people find you, find more information, whatever else you want to plug? Well, um, the easiest thing is I'm kind of plugging my, my, my personal website, which is drjustindean.com. And from there, I write, I write some blog posts, mainly generated because I'm kind of focusing on my clinic. So they're really written for the lay public. Yep. But if you're in, if you're, if you're not a lay person, you will, definitely find them int intriguing as well. It's just not going to have the jargon, the medical jargon as much. Uh, I specifically have a sciatica page on there right now that okay. I think most people will find pretty helpful. Um, and maybe we can link that in the show notes. I think that Absolutely. most people will like that. The, um, <clears throat> or you can follow me on Instagram at Dr. Justin Dean. Pretty easy. You can email me anytime if you have questions at drjustindean at gmail.com. So I keep my my branding pretty simple. <laughs> Good call. Uh, I, I listened to a book recently. Like you can have everything taken from you, but you can't have your name taken from you. So I'm oh, like, like oh. I think years ago I went and bought my name as a domain just so I had it. Oh, smart. Yeah, I did that a long time ago as well. So, so it looks like the next question. Uh, we have one more, right? Um, which one was that? What's the next progression? Oh yeah, what do you see just moving forward uh, with progression with patients? You know, just from what you've seen so far, kind of coming up. Um, you know, with the dermal traction, like, do you see a next frontier? The next frontier, um, like with personally or like like globally? Uh, however you want to frame that. Like, what do you see yourself? Let's just do you. What you see, kind of you evolving into. Well, it's both me and globally. I would say oh, the, the next tier of 
um, world-class clinicians will be who integrates everything together. I, I, I think that's where these things are going because there's so much information exploding and there's so many different camps, but the body doesn't think in segmental terms. We just give the brain, we just give things a name because we, that's how we communicate to each other as humans. But the human body doesn't think that way. So the clinician, trainer, ATC that can effectively link all that stuff together, which is exactly my mission, it will take the, the, that's the next frontier, I think. That's what's gonna take all of us to the next level is, is how, and, and how we understand the human body. It's not just fascia, it's not just the brain, it's not just nerves, it's not just happy feelings, it's everything combined together, and how do you navigate that system effectively? Uh, and that's that's really like, that's where I see these things going. It, I like it and couldn't couldn't disagree with you if I wanted to. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's um. Thanks for having me on the show. Do you have any other questions based on what we talked about? Uh, I don't think so right now. Um, I would love to do a round two at some point, specifically with track and field athletes. Sure. Um, I did that. I worked with some, with it at the University of Kansas and again at Oklahoma State. Uh, we've got a heck of a track program at where I'm at now. So I uh, would love to do a round two sometime, just discussing more of the specifics of that and getting into more details. Or specifically, if you had things that you wanted to cover in terms of that, we could definitely tailor an episode to that. Well, to track and field it would definitely be a good thing, be a good episode, because I was a track and field athlete myself. Okay. So that's that's um <clears throat> like runners specifically is an area that I've focused quite a bit. I was a I ran a 228 marathon back in the day. So I've, Solid. Like, I've definitely done I've walked the walk in the running world. Like right. so there's you know, there's 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 a certain language with every sport, you know, that, that people can relate to. Yep. You have to like say certain things, you have to if you've never ran a hundred mile week then you can't relate to somebody that has. Right. <laughs> so that's that's so that'd be a very interesting topic of discussion because distance runners are crazy, crazy bastards and Yes, they are. Yeah. And you can have knee pain for six months. I remember in college I bruised my foot and I was limping around walking, but I literally ran on that thing for six months. I wouldn't shock me. That would, I worked with a pretty good distance crew at Oklahoma State and some of the stuff those those guys would do to get through is incredible. Yeah, yeah. So it's, 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 it's to understand the mind of a distance runner is a completely different beast. <laughs> I would say that most people that have never done an extreme endurance sport, it's it's hard to relate to it. It's like when I go into the weight room and I'm doing power cleans, I'm like, why is this fun? <laughs> yeah, I gotta understand that. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like I'm doing spot, I'm doing like three or four of them. I'm like, yeah, this sucks. <laughs> why am I doing this? <laughs> I still do it because I'm trying to get more of a. I'm trying to be diversify myself, but yeah, nothing wrong with that. So, so yeah, man, that's something for the future that we get to discuss. Awesome. Yes, that I think that would be a great episode and one I'd just be curious to get your insights on. So, yeah, I think I'd probably have some unique, um, unique ideas there because I have been trained by some uh, what's considered world leading experts in biomechanics, like yep. running by like uh, Irene Davis. She was at Harvard, you know her? Yep. And then Franz Bosch from Holland. Yep, yep. And a few others. So there's uh, there's quite a there's quite a few um, people that have worked in track and field. Obviously, I worked with Altus, with Dan Papp a bit. So there's that. So um, I wouldn't, I'm not pretending to be as knowledgeable as any of those people that I mentioned <laughs> from a biomechanics perspective, but it's at least I can compare and contrast. Definitely. Yeah. Totally, man. Awesome. Well, thank you for taking the time. We really appreciate it. I, this is going to be a great episode. We'll look forward to getting it out. Thank you for checking out this episode of Clinically Press. Go to clinicallypress.com for full show notes and links to everything that was covered in this episode. While you're there, you have access to all of our episodes, insights, and shorts. 
You can find Clinically Press on YouTube and any, any other podcast outlet. If you could give us a rating, thumbs up, or review on how we are doing, we would greatly appreciate it. To get more free content delivered to your inbox, sign up for Total Athletic Therapy Newsletter. You'll get direct links to all Clinically Pressed episodes, reviews on some of the latest research in health and performance, and links to related podcasts and other items meant to help you make the complicated, simple, and optimized performance. Thank you for listening, and see you next episode.